to Enlightenment of Change on webtalkradio.com. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. My guests and I are excited that you're joining us this week. So here's the deal, right? As soon as we hear that word change, we get that knot in our stomach and think, oh my gosh, what's my next step? How do I move forward? What do I do? Especially if the change has been thrust upon you. Well, in my six de decades of living, I have learned that whenever change happens, the biggest tool or resource or uh, skill that we could bring to the table to minimize or navigate that change efficiently, and maybe with a little bit of ease and grace, it boils down to having really clear communication skills. So in the show notes, you'll see my link. I have my communication style assessment, my gift to you. You'll get two reports. One just spotlights your natural communication superpowers. It's how your message lands with people naturally for you. Here's the more important report. Your lowest score is usually a blind spot. So really look at that report to see when you're communicating with people who maybe approach communication 180 degrees different than you, mm, how's your message landing there? Probably even more important. So again, link is in the show notes, my gift to you, and I hope it helps you navigate whatever change you're dealing with in your life. So it's interesting for today to set the stage for the conversation. I chose actually two quotes. Um, they're both by millennials. The first one, and there was no name, it just said Millennial China, Millennial US. So the millennial that uh, gave this quote from China says, strong leadership companies have the ability to create new jobs for the community and to improve human life. The millennial from the US, again, no name, said companies where people look up to and do what is right to serve the communities they are involved in have the strongest leadership. So here's the deal. You know, my, my oldest son is a Gen Y, Gen Z. He's right on the cusp. My younger son is a Gen Z. So I'm fascinated always to hear their perspective on business, why they buy different products or services or people they follow, and what their take is on that work-life balance and what that looks like. So here's why I always seek their advice, as well as my clients who are those Gen Z, Gen Y um, uh, groups um, I encounter in my business, um, I'm always curious to see their perspective. And here's why. Studies show that Generation Zs and the Generation Y believe business should be used as a force for good. Business that make money while violating basic human rights and damaging the, the environment are being boycotted by this younger generation as they feel that their money should go to businesses that are doing good in the world. So this is a change. The This is a big change, I think, in the business landscape and the way that I think companies have to kind of stand up and pay attention. So who is my amazing guest today where we're going to talk about the Gen Zs and the Gen Ys? Her name is Shadan Capri. Uh, she's an attorney, business owner, and author who has been recognized on the local, national, and international level for her dedication to human rights and environmental justice. She focuses on how the younger generations demand that business be used as a force for good, and they are voting with their dollar when it comes to supporting brands and businesses um, that leave a, a behind a more positive legacy. So Shadon, thank you so much uh, for being on. And this this is important for businesses to stand up and listen. Absolutely. And we're seeing this happen across the landscape. Even companies like Tiffany and Company, which is an industry icon in the jewelry business, yeah. is saying that we need more ethical diamonds. People are people care about how the diamonds that they give their, you know, fiance, their wife, their girlfriend, how was it sourced? So it goes back to exactly what you were saying is that Gen Z's are changing the landscape and saying business as usual does not work. We need to know that this company, this brand, this event is actually leaving behind a positive legacy and not a negative one. And we and we see that a lot today with this whole unfortunate uh, P. Diddy scandal that's happening a lot of people are have stopped supporting his brands have stopped listening to his music yeah. uh and so it's it's very different from you know even five years ago whereas now if you are accused or if there's allegations and you are arrested that is a huge hit to your brand and businesses are starting to really kind of wake up to this about how the consumer is changing the landscape yeah, I want to comment on two things you said. That last piece, um, 
about being arrested years ago, right? It used to be, hey, publicity is publicity, good or bad. It gets your name out there. Mm -hmm. Now it, it can have a detrimental effect. So very interesting. I never mm -hmm. even thought about that. And the other mm -hmm. one, I, I recently had nieces that got engaged. Um, and so you know, the diamonds were lovely and, you know, showing me the ring and I was all excited. And they said that they're, I'm going to use the wrong terminology, uh, sh Shadon. Uh, it, it, they're not, they weren't mines. They were grown in a lab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stunning, gorgeous. They have all the properties of it. They gave me this whole education because my engagement rings a real diamond, right? From <laughs> 32 years ago. Yeah. So this new sourcing, right? Of being lab grown, but having the same properties as a diamond, mm -hmm. it's because the demand was there by this generation. Whole new education for me. So fascinating. And that's why I really like learning from that younger generation. Number one, it keeps you, well, you're much younger than me, but it keeps me relevant, but also understanding when, when you hear these things happening, what that impact could be to a business, right? Cause that's who I support um, our businesses. So mm -hmm. my, my next question, I know you talk about the red movement. What is that? So it's a movement that actually the book was launched back in 2020 and what it does is it takes the idea that we as individuals are so much more powerful than we think, right? The one thing that binds us all is the fact that we have red blood, regardless of your background, regardless of your ancestry, regardless of your race, regardless of your orientation, we all have red blood going through mm -hmm. our bodies. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's called the red movement. So it's really a movement for social and environmental justice. And one of the things it's the way it's different from the other movements that we've seen is it actually provides solutions to people. People. It actually gives them things that they can do that just not better their life, but also potentially better the lives of other people. Um, what people don't realize is, like you said, voting with your dollar, it is incredibly powerful. And we're seeing this time and time again, as brands either get good publicity or bad publicity, it's affecting their bottom line. And it's changing the way companies do business, which is good. We want companies to start doing business differently. We don't want our clothes sourced from forced labor, slave labor. We don't want our diamonds, you know, unethically resourced. We don't want the toys that we buy for our children to be based from sweatshops in China. And I think because of globalization, we now have supply chains that are around the world, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. But we also have information that sometimes those supply chains aren't good. They're their violation of human rights, they they destroy the environment, there's toxic dumping. And so what the red movement does is it increases awareness about sort of how powerful we really are in terms of where our money goes and businesses are listening. I mean, the red movement has been going on for a while. It just didn't really have a name until now. How did it begin? Like where I get the, I get the blood, right? And, and first of all, let me just comment. I love that because again, I, when I meet people, I don't care who they are, where they come from, what their traditions, what their, I, I don't care. Let me learn from you. How can I support you, right? Together, we're more powerful than me alone mm -hmm. or you alone, perhaps. And our blood is all red. So I love mm -hmm. that concept because when we peel it away, I think humans, we all want the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Our children to be happy and healthy, mm -hmm. for us to be able to put food on the table without mm -hmm. struggle or pay for a roof over their head, right? Be able to have a flushing toilet. I think at the core, we all want the same thing. We just go about getting it um, differently. And sometimes we don't want to hear other opinions which I think is very dangerous um, because everybody has a valid perspective and you know, mm -hmm. you never know what somebody's going to say where you think, oh, I never, ever thought of that. Mm -hmm. That is a brilliant way to look at it. Again, doesn't mean you have to agree, but it's such a nice way to expand our own individual perspectives and get rid of biases and all of those things. So I'm loving it. But now I'm going to go back to my question. So Red Movement, I've never heard of it until I met you. Mm -hmm. How did this begin if you said the book was published in 2020? Did it actually start before? Yes. So back in, I would say, 20. 2004, I was in oh. law school. I was, I was like every person, you know, I, I did an internship in DC, you know, the whole, the whole thing. And uh, I was really lucky enough when I did this internship, I went to events that were being put on by different think tanks and different organizations. Mm. And 
I started to connect the dots. It started to all kind of come together when I thought about sort of the human rights issues that are going on around the world and how most people, you know, we share the same humanity. We don't want a job that's exploitative. We don't want our job to violate our human rights. But at the same time, we don't want to support companies, brands, events, people that violate other people's human rights. Yeah. And so I, I it sort of came, it's, it's a funny story. It all happened because of an email exchange I was having with someone at the time. And this person was like a career coach. And they were saying to me, what is it that you want to do? And I remember it just randomly came out in the email. I said, I want what we have with the organic movement where people want to buy food that's healthy and that's good for their body and good for the environment. I want to do that, but for everything else. And that's how the red movement was born. So just like, so there's some people that will only buy organic because they know, you know, how lethal it is to put those kind of fertilizers in our body for a lifetime. There's also people that, that want to buy things that are ethical, that want to support brands that are doing good in this world, that want to help people get out of poverty. And how do we do that? We do that by voting with our dollar. We do that by supporting companies that are doing good in this world. And in the book, I talk about there's so many amazing companies that have come up because of Gen Z, because of millennials, that their mission statement is to do good. There's this, and, and I give you pages and pages and pages of sort of who these companies are and the, and the things they're doing. One of them, which I love, is called One Tree. So anytime you buy an item from them, they plant a tree. And their goal is to plant, I think, like 100 million by a certain date. And they've already planted thousands and thousands of trees. But that's what I'm talking about is about knowing that our hard earned money is going towards brands, people, events that are doing good in this world, that are not exploiting others, that are not exploiting the environment, that are not doing things that are shady, that make us think, do we want to be a part of that? Because a part of it is when we're silent, we're complicit. Yes. And we're seeing that now with the whole P. Diddy situation. Yeah. All these other individuals were there and saw it and did nothing. And so that's what the Red Movement's about. It's about people who understand that we have a shared humanity and understand that we have an obligation to each other that transcends organizations, countries, backgrounds, orientation, races. And yeah. so what the Red Movement does is it brings all this information together to people and helps them make choices that are empowering for them and then also empowering for the world. Yeah, I love it. I just love the whole premise. And it's funny because, um, you know, I'm in sales. I've been in sales 40 years, ethically so, right? So I always look at the client and how can I help them where they are? And don't, I never go in, uh, Shadon, with, with a, a preconceived, she's going to need. I never do mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. until I meet and I chat and we get to know each other, I'm not really sure how I'm going to be able to help you. Right. So that customization, mm -hmm. I believe serves right at that higher level, mm -hmm. because I'm not pushing what makes more money for me or what mm -hmm. I think they should have. It's really, well, what do you need? And then sometimes it's not even me. I bring in other people and say, I can't help you with this, but I have a vetted colleague that I trust um, and they'll be able to help you. Right. So it's doing the right thing. And I don't remember this was a couple of years ago, but they remember with the college, um, they hired the guy, I want to say he was out in California, a lot of the celebrities to get their kids into the Ivy Leagues and the higher higher schools. And he went in the side door was how he did it. But anyway, my husband and I watched that documentary and everybody kept referring to this guy who was getting them in the side door, right? I forget whatever his name was. Oh, he's great at sales. Every time they said that, I paused it. I looked at my husband. I said, he's scum. This is not being good at sales. This is being a con artist. Mm -hmm. Why do why do people take con artists and sales and lump them together? If you're really good at sales and or your business, like you're saying, and you're making a difference in the world and, and we're serving, right? We're making money, but we're serving and you're doing mm -hmm. it the right way. You're not a con artist. You're mm -hmm. good at sales, right? You're 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 managing that client relationship beautifully instead mm -hmm. of right? Fitting the square peg in the round hole, making a ton of money and doing it with some type of illegal um, essence, but pay attention. They always oh, good in sales. That makes me crazy because it makes sales a dishonorable um, mm -hmm. profession versus an extremely honorable profession. If somebody has an issue situation and you have the solution to that problem, 
that's that to me is sales, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have to be really careful in our phraseology and how we look at things. But I'm loving this red movement because it's peeling back the onion to say, it's okay to make money, but we can make money doing it the right way and with integrity and honesty and giving back to the world and to humanity. Why haven't we been doing this all along? You can hear my frustration with this mm -hmm. um, because I've been cons, right? Even as a salesperson, you I'm sure you've mm -hmm. bought things and they weren't what you were expecting. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. We can do it mm -hmm. honestly. So why aren't we, right? Well, I think it goes back to sort of this whole idea that the duty is toward the shareholder. And I disagree with that fundamentally. Uh, the duty is not toward the shareholder. The duty is really towards the customer and towards the greater good and towards yeah. the community that we are taking from. Yeah. Um, this whole, I mean, I believe in, I understand capitalism. I'm not against capitalism. I think capitalism can be used as a force for good. And what you said in the beginning with your with your your son, Gen Zs are are forcing this to happen. Gen Zs are saying we are not going to support these companies that are doing bad in this world. We're not going to buy their music. We're not going to buy their clothes. We're not going to go to their events. And Gen Z's in, in many ways are trailblazers. They really are. They're changing the landscape. They're changing the way companies, they're forcing some companies to change the way they do yeah, business. And what they're doing is they're teaching sort of the rest of us that, yes, you can make lots of money in this world and you can be successful, but you can also do it in a way that leaves behind a positive legacy, yeah. not just for you, but for your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren that you're never yeah. going to meet. Yeah. And so I really applaud Gen Z for... I don't know if they just have the courage or if they've just been exposed to so much information via the internet that they have different ideas, that they're not yeah. so indoctrinated into this idea that success lo looks a certain way and capitalism is the only way to go. You can do capitalism, but it has to be done with a conscience. It has to be done with an understanding that you are there to serve the client, the consumer, not just the shareholder. Now, do shareholders make money? Yes, absolutely. But they are not the most important thing in this yeah. equation. The world, the world we live in, the communities, the people, they are important, the consumer. And so what this movement does is it puts consumer in the driver's seat. Number one, it empowers them. And number two, it lets them start to make choices that align with who they are inside and not just with the idea of being successful at any cost. Yeah. And I like what you said before that, you know, to see it, to watch it and not say anything or still buy from those particular companies, right? That's being complicit. You're silently complicit. Mm -hmm. That's not okay either, right? Watching on the sidelines and allowing it um, to happen, right? We all have a voice. We all have a, a part to play in this and to create really lasting change. There mm -hmm. you'll right you you've you've seen it obviously since you oh, yeah. published the book in 2020, um mm -hmm. it becomes a snowball effect right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. as it gains more power and more notoriety more people are jumping on board and here's why uh it's logical <laughs> it forget about the emotional piece of it it's a logical mm -hmm. way to make money and doing it being able to put your head on the pillow at night and say wow I really made a difference in the world and mm -hmm. capitalism is alive I'm still making money so I again I think the whole thing is great I have to ask you Don did you're passionate about this which I love by the way did something happen was there an issue like what made you go I'm doubling down on this man that's a great question. And the the reality is, and, and I say this and it, it sounds kind of strange. I think the Gen Zers will understand it when I say, I think this issue picked me. I, I, for some reason, I remember when I was doing that internship in DC while I was in law school, I went to an event and they started talking about human trafficking. They started talking about sex trafficking. And this was in 2004 where there wasn't a lot of conversation about those kind of things. Not yeah. like there is now, 20 yeah. years later. And a voice inside of me, as crazy as the sound, a voice inside of me said, this is it. This is it. Because I, I had, you know, in law school, people were like, are you political? Are you cause oriented? You know, why are you here? And people would ask me that. And I would say, well, I'm not really a political person. I don't want to go into politics. I'm more of a cause driven person. And my friends would say, well, what's your cause? And I'd say, 
I don't know. I'm still sur- I'm still working for that. I'm still trying to find what my cause is, right? I don't want to go into politics. I don't want to do anything political, but I do want to make a difference in this world. And when I went to that event, as strange as it sounds, a voice inside of me said, this is it. This is this is what you've been looking for, this issue. And so in many mm-hmm. ways, I think the issue picked me. And I know that sounds crazy. I know that for some people, it's not going to make any sense. But for me, once I found it, I just hit the ground running. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love that you published the book too. And I, because th- I think the more aware we can like through these mm-hmm. podcasts, right through a book by you doing your speaking events and, you know, through your uh, law firm that we can make a difference. And again, it, it's just that whole, that snowball, that ripple effect mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. can be exponential and really um, put, put you on the map with what you're doing because there's, there's good stuff behind the movement. It's not mm-hmm. just fluff and crap, right? Like there's real meat and potatoes that people can bite into. It makes sense. Again, it's, it's, it's the emotion of can I leave a legacy, but it's the logic of, well, this is how to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And how we Mm -hmm. spend our Mm -hmm. dollars is is a big one. But the Gen Zs, I do, I agree with you. I think they're brilliant. I think they're courageous. Mm -hmm. And I think that their um, desire to do good, but also not accepting what has been like, well, that's the way it is, but why? That's not okay. And them doubling down and saying, I'm just not going to buy, or I'm going to start doing this or whatever. I'm going to do my career this way, versus soul sucking job, whatever it might be. So I really give the Gen Z's and the Gen Y started, but the Gen Z's I think are really running with it. What So what's your ultimate goal with this whole movement? I'm on board, man. I'm loving it. But what's your ultimate goal if you, know, if you could fast forward to the future? And this came out, it, I w- was working with that career coach and that he asked me that we were emailing back and forth. And he, and I said, I want the red movement to be what what green is, what organic is. When we think of green, we think of organic. I want the red movement. When you think of the red movement, you think of ethically sourced items. You think of human rights. You think of um, protecting the environment. And so I, as strange as it sounds, I know I know it sounds a crazy, 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 crazy idea. But when people say, I want this item, I want to know that this item was ethically created. I want that to become synonymous with red because yeah. red at the end of the day, we all, as much as we're different, as much as we have different backgrounds and interests, we're all fundamentally the same. We all have the same humanity. We all yeah. want good for not just our family, but for also other people as Absolutely. well. And so with Gen Z's and, and Gen Z's and, and millennials, they're the ones that are creating some of these, these new companies, these companies that are starting with a mission statement and saying, this is our mission. Everything we do will support this mission. And these companies are doing incredibly well. I mean, once people, and I think the the disconnect is getting the word out there for like the the one tree company, Um, just going on Google and just Googling like ethically sourced clothes, ethically sourced diamonds, ethically sourced, even coffee and chocolate. I start off the book. The very first chapter is about the chocolate that we get. 70% of the chocolate in the world comes from the Ivory Coast in Africa. And the Ivory Coast has a huge child trafficking problem. They've had it for the last 20 years. People know, you know, they've tried to pass laws. I mean, I I go into it. It, it, It's a whole thing. But people, many people still don't know that when you buy coffee, it matters who you're buying the coffee from. If you're getting it from the Ivory Coast, then there's some, there's most likely going to be some problems. And now we're seeing this with Starbucks. Starbucks has completely changed. If you go into a Starbucks, you will see it say ethically sourced. You know, these companies are waking up to this and I hate to say it and I, I I hate to say it, but I think that with the scandals that have happened recently in the mm. last five to 10 years, mm. corporations are becoming very aware of their actions, what that looks like, and then how that translates into actual dollars. And this is what we want. We want companies to do good. We want Starbucks to care about, you know, is the coffee that they sell to us, is it ethically sourced? Is it sourced from for children that are trafficked in in Africa or is it sourced in a way that's actually good for the environment and that gives people the chance to have a livable wage I mean these are all such important questions and I think with globalization with the internet as much as you know 
we live across the world, all the internet has brought us together and it's given us more access to information than yeah. any generation has ever gotten. Yeah. And I think now we want to use that for the good. And, and Gen Z's are requiring it. I mean, study after study after study shows that they will not support brands, people, events, um, products that exploit others or the environment. And, and these companies are starting to, to kind of listen. Thank God. It's about yeah. time. Well, because you're hitting them in the pocketbook, right? It's it's all about the money, the flow of money. And if they're taking a hit, how can we how can we uh, get that segment of the population back? Mm -hmm. Because it's a big segment of the population and they're mm -hmm. they're making money now, right? So they're spending money. Um, how do we capture that? What are things that people can do every day um, that just can make the world a better place and and not be a big deal, right? But but kind of an easy lift, if you will. Right. Well, one of the things, um, the last three chapters of my book about solutions, I talk about what you're saying, what can the average person do? What can we do as a society? And one of the simple things is just to buy used, is just to buy used items. Because number one, it keeps the item out of the landfill, which mm -hmm. is good for the environment. And number two, you're not exploiting more people. You know, when you make that piece of clothing or when you buy that toy or when you get, you know, that item, whatever that is, buy used. It's good for the environment. It's cheaper. People save money. But also you're not doing, you're not supporting a company that's using, you know, child labor, forced labor, slave labor, or any type of mm -hmm. exploitative ways to make the part, to make their product. I was you know it was so funny because when I was in my 20s the idea of buying used was just like I couldn't do that and now it's like everything I buy is used I go on marketplace you know yeah. I, go, I, I go to these thrift shops and you can get some amazing things some yeah. really good high quality things so just that one act uh, will save you money but it's also good for the environment and it's also good you know in terms of you know that you're not buying another t-shirt that some poor kid in Bangladesh made yeah. you know that the money is staying in the community and it's supporting a local business so just something as simple as that and there's apps nowadays where if you do buy something new there's apps that you can go to that tell you you know does this company have a good reputation does this company is it known for sourcing its materials or does it have a horrible reputation so the information is out there. I think the struggle has been getting it to the masses. And that's yeah. why I wrote this book. And I do these kind of podcasts because I think the more people know, like you said, it's a snowball effect. And this is the reason I get up in the morning. I truly, like this, this is the reason that I am here in this world is to sort of raise this awareness. And if I can get people involved, I can't think of, using my time in any way that's better than that. Yeah, because your personal ripple effect, right? The world will be better off. People in your locale will be better off, right? Even if we go, if we get, kind of get in the weeds of, of our own location, our backyard, so to speak, mm -hmm. but we can make a difference in our own communities, mm -hmm. our own families, right? Drill into mm -hmm. your own family, right? It doesn't have to be a grandiose kind of effort. It could mm -hmm. be something that you're doing for yourself, your family, your kids, what, what, what you have, you know, what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, what what do you think at the end of all of this? What do you think the bit that businesses really do need to learn and understand um, before they get pinched right in the in their pocketbook? Silence means you're complicit. We're seeing this with the P, P Diddy case. People are not only just saying, you know, why did P Diddy do this? People are saying, why did the people around them not say anything? Why did these, these, these corporations work with him? Why did people support him? Why did people see these things happening and staying silent? And so my belief is when you're silent, you're part of the problem. You're part of the problem because not only are you not stopping it, but you're encouraging it through your mm -hmm. silence. You're encouraging it. And so you go from one white party to two white parties to, they're saying that there potentially could be thousands of victims, thousands of victims. I mean, it's hard <sighs> for me to put my head around that. It's Think disgusting. how many people had to watch it and say nothing for there to be thousands of victims. I, yeah. I, it's mind blowing. It's yeah. mind blowing. It and hurts. So, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts my heart. It hurts my humanity because I know we as people are better than that. Yeah. If you 
care for your child, then you should care that another child is not trafficked. You should care that another child is not sexually exploited. You should care. I mean, this, this idea that your responsibility is only to your family is false. Your responsibility is to your community. It's to the world. It's to making any space that you enter better. If you're not doing that, then you're part of the problem. And that is what I'm trying to get people to understand. Yeah. And, and I hear you. And and I, I could share such an example when my kids, now they're men, right? But when they were little, um, they had a psychologist come into the the grammar school Mm -hmm. um, in the library and they did a presentation about bullying and how can we help our kids learn not to bully, to to stand up if someone's getting bullied, all the things that you're talking about, right? For these little kids though. Mm -hmm. And my sister and my two cousins and myself, we all live in the same town. Our kids went through the same school system. The four of us went together saying, oh, this is so good. And well, you know, we can articulate even better, you know, ways for our kids to step up and write all these things. Well, as I was looking around, I leaned over to my sister and I said, look around and see all the parents that are here. Which parents are missing? The mm. kids that were the bullies? Parents mm. weren't there. So mm-hmm. I remember coming home and and I would share with my kids what, you know, what I learned today, you know, the school ran this little program and, you know, Aunt Ro and I went and this is what we learned. And mm-hmm. ironically, fast forward, my kids are very big, uh, Shadon, that my, my big guy is six, four, and my little guy is like six, three. They're, they're big. They were big when they were little, they always, they were a head bigger than their class. Right. So they were big boys, <laughs> kind, but big. So I remember my older son came home one day and he said, yeah, mom, we let whatever the kid's name is play. I had never heard the name before. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, who is that? Is that your friend? He goes, no, he goes, but a bunch of the kids on the playground were picking on him. He said, so my friends and I went over and said, leave him alone. And they said to him, not an athletic kid, right? My kids are very athletic. Mm -hmm. So I was shocked by this, but he said to the kid, come and play with us. I said, well, was he good at kickball or whatever? And he goes, no, he goes, but he needed the protection. They were being mean to him. He said, so we went over and said, back off. And now he goes, not that he always wants to play with us, but at least he hangs out with us because he knows no one's going to bug him. And I giggled because it was all after the bullying thing. And I said, they weren't complicit. My kids and their, their friends, right? Good boys went over and said, hang with us. Like, like they were protecting them, but they didn't say that. They just said, come and hang with us and they won't mess with you. And the kid was very um, excited and then followed them, you know, into recess. And I said, does it bother you? He goes, no, he's an okay kid. You know, he doesn't bother us. He comes and he plays. And so my son, my son and his friends didn't think anything of it other than it wasn't okay that he was getting bullied. That's Mm -hmm. what we're talking about. And we can instill this into our little kids. So they become, when they become adults, right, Shadon? They're more like what we're talking about. And now I see my kids are behaving this way at their men with jobs, with money, with girlfriends. How are they spending their money? All of that foundational information, I could see it playing out. And and I believe, I agree with you. They grew up with the internet. They grew up with having a computer in their hand, right? With their iPhone. Mm -hmm. So they could look anything up they want. They're much more aware than Mm -hmm. I know I was as a little Mm -hmm. kid, right? Or as, Mm -hmm. you know, growing up through the years. Mm -hmm. It's it's incredible. It's incredible just how um, worldly kids are at this age at, you know, at ages where I, I, some of the things I hear, I'm just like, where, where did you learn that? How do you know that? Like, it's incredible. And I really applaud them because they understand that our shared humanity cannot be bought and sold. It cannot be compromised. It should not be exploited. And the more we sit on the sidelines and we say nothing and we just look the other way or we look down or we nod, that makes us just as bad as the perpetrators. And I, and I know for some people, they understand that. And for some people they think, well, no, that's, I'm not doing that. I'm not part of the problem, right? You're not part of the problem. You're not a corporation, but by looking the other way and supporting these corporations, you become part of the problem. Yeah. And I just buy into it. You buy into it, you support it, and these corporations get bigger and bigger every day. Yeah. You know, I'm loving the movement. Uh, You have a a fan. I I could tell you that. I think that we just have to learn how to be freaking nicer to each other Mm -hmm. and forget we can all make a lot of money and take that money, right, and take care of our families and then go out and do really good things with it, right? It's not a bad thing to make money. It's how you make the money that we're talking mm-hmm. about, right? Be- making money and being successful and being able to be philanthropic. They're all really good things to aspire to, right? Mm-hmm. But you got to do it the right way.
way. So yeah, I'm I'm a fan, uh, Shadon. Thank you so much. Uh, we're out of time. I, I hate that it goes so fast because you know there's more questions, right? That we we would love to talk about. It's important, um, everyone listening. So I will put this in the show notes, but Shadan's um, email is shadancapri at iCloud.com. It will be in the show notes. Website is red and then a hyphen movement.com. Again, that will be in the show notes. Um, any new books on the horizon? Shadan? Actually, yes. I have been working on some new books. Um, I'm I'm working on this in another book called The Light Within. It's about sort of taking the the challenges and the heartbreak that we all go through and channeling that in a way that's positive for yourself and for everyone around you. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 exciting. I love to write and I feel like that's my gift to the world is is being able to put my thoughts into you know, into words and then sharing it with others and hoping that they get something out of it. If anything, mm. I believe in humanity. I believe that all of us want to do good in this world. I believe that if you want your children to be protected, you have to be willing to protect other children too, because you're not always going to be there. Sometimes yeah. you're going to have to rely on a stranger to look out for your kid. And so once we realize that and start working as a community and not as individuals, they're separate. I think the world will just get better. One decision, one choice, one purchase at a time. It's fascinating to me, listening to you, um, choosing to go to law school, having that engagement in 2004 via that email, um, knowing you weren't political because all of the, all of my young people listening to the show um, or parents listening, share it because those thought processes, even though you're like, I don't know, it eventually, but you, but you knew in your heart, it was mm -hmm. something from a cause related. Mm -hmm. And then it found you because you were open to it, right? That's the magic of the universe. That's the mm -hmm. magic um, of being human and listening to our soul. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we're here to do. Yes, mm -hmm. to make money and all that, but we're here to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, our souls need to they, they need to find their purpose and then they need mm -hmm. to execute their purpose. And you're doing just that. So you're fascinating. I just loved meeting you, uh, Shadon. Thank you so much for uh, being on and thank you for this movement. I'm loving it and I'm loving you, kiddo. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, real, real, real treat. This was just such a treasure of a conversation. Keep on, keep on rocking your cool self out there and making a difference. Beautiful, just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you will join me weekly as we question, build, and discover together, no matter where you are on your journey of change, my guests and I, we get it. And hopefully our stories, our books, um, our action steps that that um, uh, Shadan sh shared with us, right? Just watch how you spend your money. Go to those apps. See how things are sourced. That's a great call to action. Share this podcast. Again, it helps my numbers, but I'm teasing. Share this podcast because the more people know, the more people that read um, the, the Red Movement book, the more we understand what our impact can be. And you said it, Shaydan. Also, it's simple things that we can do that can make this huge difference. So it's not even a heavy lift or a big call to action um, that mm -hmm. I'm asking. So I end every show this way. They're like, here she comes. It's repetitive. Information's a beautiful thing. If mm -hmm. we do nothing with it, it's information in our brain. As soon as we take that information and we do something with it, the ripple effect is where the magic happens, right? And we could create life-changing events, life-changing situations for ourselves and others, and we can make really an impact in the world. So mm -hmm. that's my rant, everybody. Again, use those apps, read the book. These are easy call to actions, um, but watch where you're spending your money and how you can make a difference. Um, because, and, and the other thing is to don't stand by in silence, because if you keep spending money with these companies that maybe don't care about um, the environment or people. And it's all about the money. Maybe we shouldn't be buying from them. You have the power to make a difference. So uh, Shadan, thank you again. Truly a pleasure meeting you and having this conversation. Um, just keep doing these, these great things. I love you. I totally love you. <laughs> oh, I love you too. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank yeah, you. same. A real pleasure. And I love all of you too. Thank you for tuning in to Enlightenment of Change with me, your host, Connie Whitman on webtalkradio.com. I am honored that you join me weekly to change your life and hopefully make it a smidge easier. Again, I'll see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. I love you. Take care.